Um, we went, uh, again, for many of us, I think the most intense and saddest experience of the whole day, we went to uh, the Javits Center, where there were about 400 people. These were loved ones of first responders who had not yet been found. And so they were, you know, the mothers, wives, children, brothers, fathers of missing police and firefighters who were at that point, three days in, you know, it was, it was very unlikely, although there was still some hope, but very unlikely that any of them would still be found alive. And they were all there in the Javits Center. And we walked into that room and it, it, it was just the most intense moment I'd ever experienced in my life. It was totally silent. It was so overwhelmingly sad. And I was, um, I stood in there about 20 minutes. The president started, I was, uh, the president started going around family to family and, and very quietly sort of putting his arm around them, asking them about their loved one. After about 20 minutes, I couldn't take it anymore. It, it was so, I felt like I was gonna explode. It was so intense in there. And so I left the room for a few minutes and he kept working, going from family to family, talking. When I walked back in, probably 20 or 30 minutes later, the entire mood had changed. He, he had managed to get people to talk about their loved ones. He, he had a few people even laughing. Tell me a story about your dad. Or, you know, and he cried with each family and he laughed. And he was at, we were actually traveling with Kirby John Caldwell, who's a reverend from Houston, who, who looked at me and said, he does this better than almost any pastor I know. And it was just amazing, the, the depth of the connection. And, and imagine the emotional wear and tear. I couldn't stand it. I mean, imagine the war, emotional wear and tear on the president. He spent almost two hours. He spent more. He spent no, nearly two and a half hours. No, 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 fo no other than Eric, no, photo no media, nobody ever, I don't remember anybody ever writing a story about it, never, never told anywhere. Um, I had a similar experience to Karen's when, first of all, it's, it's not fair to call it a room, that he entered a room. It was the parking garage, yeah, like <laughs> and they had taken pipe and drape and roped off an area big enough for these 400 family members to be inside, but I mean, there was, this was not a room with comfortable chairs and a nice carpet on the floor to sit in. This was a parking garage in the middle of a convention center. And Karen, 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 Karen described it. I, 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 I'll admit it. I was weeping uncontrollably after 15 minutes and had to leave. And, and I think only two people were in that room for the full two and a half hours. One of them was the president and, well, Secret Service, of course, so I, they may have shifted in and out. And Joe Hagan, the White, Deputy Chief of Staff for Administration at the White House, who's in charge of the advance operation. But I, I got to tell you, I, I remember when I had to leave the room the first time. I had to leave the room several times. But a little kid, he was blonde. I remember him. He was blonde, really blonde. And he came up and confronted the president and held up with both of his hands the picture of his father, police officer, and never said a word, just held it up to the president. And the president talked to him and then took the picture and wrote a note to his father on the back. I think the kid may have said his father's name, but he wrote it. That's about all he said. And the president comforted him. And the, and the little boy just reached out very quickly and grabbed a hold of the president and just held on for life. And the president just held him. And, you know, the kid, there was no chance he was ever going to see his father alive. And all he wanted to do was hold on to the president and have some sense of comfort. And this went on for two and a half hours. Kirby John Caldwell was a high flyer on Wall Street who one day woke up and said, is this what life is supposed to be about? And went back to Houston, Texas and started a church in an, in an abandoned shopping center. And he's a really remarkable guy. And I really felt guilty when I walked out of there say, thinking to myself, I made... I really, I have an obligation to throw myself back in there. And a few minutes later, he came out weeping. And for some reason or another, it was comforting. If, if, he, if this extraordinary person couldn't take it, I, I, I didn't need to feel guilty about not being able to take it. But the president did. For two, two, we arrived at the Javits Center at 4.45 p.m. He walked in, and there was a shift change, and he posed for pictures. It couldn't have been more than 20, 30 minutes. Maybe call it a half an hour. Call it 5.15. We left there at 7.58, one hour and 40 minutes after the schedule said we were supposed to leave there. And uh, the entire time in between, he was comforting those families. 
before I uh, end the evening with a quote from President Bush, uh, I'd like to ask those in our audience who served uh, in, the, in the White House during 9-11 to stand up and be recognized, please. President Bush wrote in his memoir, Decision Points of 9-11, September 11th redefined sacrifice. It redefined duty, and it redefined my job. The story of that week is the key to understanding my presidency. For as long as I held office, I could never forget what happened in America that day. I would pour my heart and soul into protecting the country. I want to thank our panelists for sharing their stories of that eventful day. And I want to thank those who just stood up and our panelists for all they did to help to keep our country secure during the administration. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you.